Well, so first, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's actually my first time in Sweden. Um, thanks for showing up on Sunday morning. I'm jet lagged, so it's easy for me, but uh, probably less easy for you guys. Um, so, I guess you've already had many days of lectures, uh, lots of lectures. So, these lectures are a little, a little off topic. Um, uh, and in fact, they're not going to be that many equations either, so hopefully these will be more relaxed compared to some of the other lectures I'm sure you've had. Um, however, so my, my objective is going to be to introduce you to a series of uh, problems in holography and in condensed matter physics uh, that I hope you'll find interesting. And I think I'll try to draw connections to problems that might be amenable to sort of sophisticated integrability type uh, approaches. So I'll try to draw some connections to the main topics of the school as we come to them, although they're not going to be super central. Alright, so indeed, let's go. So what the, the rough outline of the lectures is going to be, I want to talk about phases of matter, quite generally, um, and how we probe them. So what observables uh, should we calculate to characterize the different possible phases of matter? Uh, so secondly, and in particular, of course, we're going to be interested in exotic phases of matter, not you know, liquids, gases, and solids, and so on. Uh, and these exotic phases of matter that I want to talk about will be characterized by the absence of quasi-particles. So I'll tell you what a quasi-particle quasi -particle just means, particle. Uh, so we want to talk about physics without quasi-particles. And uh, thirdly, the third topic that I want to talk about is going to be some physics of disorder. So I'm going to talk about uh, disorder physics. So all of these three topics, I'll talk about their realization in holography, but also I really want to emphasize the more general physical aspects that apply to many systems. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the mission, the mission statement. Okay, so let's, let's start. So here's the, the question we'll start with. Let's consider the following thing. So take a quantum field theory. So just uh, have in mind your favorite quantum field theory. I wonder what that might be in this audience. But, uh, any one you want. And let this quantum field theory uh, have a global U1 symmetry. Okay, you can have a bigger symmetry. You can have a so six symmetry if you want, but it should have at least the U1 symmetry. Okay. Now, let's consider this system, this quantum field theory, at zero temperature. Okay, it's probably what you want to do anyway. Uh, but, at a finite charge, density with respect to the symmetry, right? So the symmetry is an operator, JMU, that describes this conserved charge. And so, we want to, we're going to consider states that have a finite charge density, uh, JT. There's an expectation value uh, for the operator JT. By the way, to remind you, the way you do this is if you want to force the system into a ground state with a non-zero charge density, what you do is you add a chemical potential. So you do this by adding a chemical potential. means that you take, take your Lagrangian and you add to it the term mu, which is the chemical potential, that's a number, times the charge operator JT. Okay? So if you take uh, this new Lagrangian, uh, you're, you're going to be forcing the system to be at finite charge density. Okay, and so in this general setup, we'd like to ask the following question. So you take the quantum filter, you have a U1 symmetry, you consider the, uh, the ground state of the system at a finite charge density. And so the question we're going to start with is what is the ground state? So what does the vacuum look like? Well, no, what does the ground state look like? And what do low energy excitations, what are the low energy excitations? So those are the questions. Alright, 
So, in the last uh, you know hundred years or so, physics, these there are basically three known answers to these questions. Um, so conventionally. Conventional systems, let's see. There are three possibilities to, to answer these questions. So one, so again, this is interesting, but we, if we were not in a chemical potential, this would just be the vacuum, okay? And there's not you could ask, okay, is the vacuum well the vacuum's not that interesting, but then here you'd ask things like, is the vacuum confining or not? Is there a mass gap or not? So these would be the questions, okay? So now we're refining these questions so that we're at a finite charge density. Right. So, if you have a bunch of bos weakly interacting bosons, and then you insist that you have a finite density of these charged bosons, what you'll end up with is basically you'll get something like Bose-Einstein condensation. And so here you end up in a superfluid. So, a superfluid is characterized by the condensate, right? The superfluid is a condensate of these bosons. So this condensate will have a phase, and that phase will spontaneously break the U1 symmetry. So the U1 you have a spontaneous symmetry breaking of your U1 symmetry. That's the condensate, right? The condensate of the bosons with the phase. Right? The phase is pointing in some direction, so it breaks the symmetry. And when you have a superfluid, that's the first question. Okay, so the ground state is a superfluid. And the low energy excitations are is the Goldstone boson. Okay. And that's totally universal, right? So whatever complicated system of bosons that you have, as long as they're weakly interacting, when you put them at finite density, something has to carry the charge. And the way the boson wants to carry the charge, it condenses. Okay, and then you have a state with the charge, but the condensate will have a phase. And uh, that breaks the U1 symmetry. And the low energy excitations are slow rotations of the phase, and that's the Goldstone boson. Okay. Now, what if you have fermions? So fermions can't condense in the same way that bosons can because of Pauli exclusion, right? So you can't form a coherent sort of macroscopically occupied states of bosons. And so fermions do something else. They build up a Fermi surface. And so what you get here is something called a Fermi liquid. Okay. So remember this is due to Pauli exclusion, which means you cannot macroscopically occupy the states So that means, remember, so that you have momentum space, you start to, you want, right, you're insisting that there's a finite charge density, right? So these, you have to start populating states. So you start with the lowest energy state at the origin, that's gone, now you have to start populating next the other states. And so once you do that, you'll build up a surface in momentum space that's populated, okay? That's called the Fermi surface. Sorry, the boundary of this region is called the Fermi surface. Now this doesn't break the U1 spontaneously, so the U1 symmetry is preserved in this case. Again, you can't break the symmetry with just fermions, because to break the symmetry, you need to macroscopically populate a state that has a definite phase. Okay? What happens is all of these electrons say that you're adding, that you're filling up the Fermi C, their phases are totally uncorrelated. Okay? And so you, can't, you don't build up a macroscopic expectation value for, for the phase. Right? And so you don't break the U1 symmetry. Okay, now, however, it turns out what, what's somewhat interesting is that even though the U1 symmetry is preserved, there's something analogous to a Goldstone boson in this system in the sense that the low energy excitations are very robust. Okay? And so, whenever you have a Fermi surface, you always have low energy excitations, which are particle hole pairs. So, let's over here. Ouch. Right, 
So the logic citations are particle hole pairs. Okay, and this is just the obvious thing, right? You have your Fermi surface, it's populated. And what you, the lowest energy thing you can do is take an electron that's very close to the surface and just move it out. So you create a hole here and you move and you create a particle there. Um, now, so I just want to tell you about a theorem. So you know there's a Goldstone theorem, okay, that guarantees that when the U1 is broken that you get these Goldstone bosons. There's another theorem that more or less guarantees the existence of these particle hole pairs in the case of fermions. Okay, and that's called Buttinger's theorem. Not the theorem in quotes. It, it's somewhat rigorous, but it, there probably are exceptions and it's not at the same level. Well, there are some assumptions that go into it. And it says uh, the following, that if you have a system of fermions, Surface is you know, there's some facts of pi and stuff that I'm not, I'm not worrying about. 
the volume of the Fermi surface is just the number of particles that you have that you filled it with. Okay? So it's obvious that for three fermions, you do have a Fermi surface. Okay? What's less obvious is that when you have interacting fermions, um, that this, should, this just says that interactions cannot kill the Fermi surface as long as they don't break the U1 symmetry. Okay? So you take fermions, so again, you have your you have a box, you put a million fermions into the box. That's some UV statement, okay? It's just how many fermions are there in your box. This is an IR statement about the zero energy excitations of the system, okay? And what you're saying is the zero energy excitation of the system lives on a surface and momentum space whose volume is, con is, is constrained to be the total charge, okay? So this is not, this is trivial for free fermions, but it's non-trivial in general. And it's like the Goldstone theorem, because it's saying that it's finite, that it guarantees the existence of some low-energy excitations under some circumstances. Okay. Does it say something about the lifetime? No. No, this is just, no, it doesn't. And maybe the quantum volume of the temperature surface, but the factor inside the temperature. Say again. So I mean, when I say volume of the Fermi surface, uh, I mean the, the area inside. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, of the Fermi, well, yeah. okay, I mean, that, that's, so by the volume of the Fermi, if that's the Fermi surface, I mean this thing. <laughs> Any other questions? So this is, it's a deep, it's a non-material and deep thing. Okay. Okay, so I said there were, so that's two answers to this question, right? So basically, if boson-like physics wins, then you break the U1 symmetry. If fermion-like physics wins, then you have a Fermi surface, and the low-energy low energy excitations live on the Fermi surface. Another thing that can happen, actually, I already cheated a little bit, so if U1 is not broken, and also uh, translation variance is not broken, Then here's a third option, which is something called the Vigna crystal. And so this is the limit if you're, let's say, your electrons, this could be fermions or bosons, if they're very dilute, okay, uh, then it turns out that the uh, potential energy between the particles is more important than the kinetic energy. And so what they do is they crystallize. So this happens when kinetic energy sort of subdominant compared to the potential energy. Okay, so that's the interactions between the particles. For fermions, this happens when they're very dilute. You say that when they're very dilute, the potential energy 
gets much yeah. bigger than the kinetic energy. Right. Is that because is that completely obvious? Yeah. So it, it's because so the more diluted, the more the more uh, concentrated it is, the more fermions there are, then the, you have to build up this Fermi surface because and so and the the, the guys up here have a lot of uh, kinetic energy because they they occupy large momentum states. Mm. But when they're very dilute, yeah. you're not occupying these high momentum states. And so there's a limit where the, the sort of the Coulomb, like potential energy between the Coulomb interactions become more important than these are free electrons. In fact, this picture is a single particle picture, right? I'm just putting in the guys. But if they're very dilute, it turns out that the, 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 potential, the, the potential energy between the electrons is more important than the. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's not obvious, right? This is not an obvious thing. It's, it's just. No. Okay. So okay. So basically, you know, uh, up till the 1980s, uh, this was this was the story. Okay. So if you had some matter, it was either broke, it was either a superconductor, superfluid, it broke the U1 symmetry, or it was basically some collection of fermions at the Fermi surface, or in the form of lattice. Okay. These are zero temperature phases of matter. So what happened, uh, you know, in the 1980s and around about plus minus 10 years, uh, is that various exotic materials were discovered, and it seems that their properties cannot be described by either of these three uh, scenarios. So now, I, on this, these lectures, I'm, I'm just going to not going to spend any time talking about data. Uh, so I'll just make. Comment. So, um, important materials in, let's say, modern uh, condensed matter physics. Okay, and so you might have in mind the group rates, that's the high temperature superconductors. You might have in mind various things called heavy fermions, various other materials. Um, do not seem to be capped. Their physics does not seem to be captured by these possibilities. Uh, do not seem to be in this one to three setup. Okay. Does not seem to be. Okay. Of course, you know. Um, in physics, you never know. So, for example, uh, the orbit of the the orbit of the moon. Actually, there were a hundred years where it wasn't described properly by Newtonian physics. Okay, Newton tried to describe the orbit of the moon, and, and it didn't it didn't work. And so, for a hundred years, it wasn't clear if Newtonian physics was wrong or that you were just missing the effect of all the other planets on the orbit of the moon carefully enough. You know, a few later, the orbit of Mercury wasn't wasn't working in Newtonian physics, and some people postulated the existence of a new planet, which is Vulcan, I think it was called Vulcan, and, but that, in this case it turned out to be that the physics was wrong. Okay, so the statement at the moment is that people have not managed to explain these materials using conventional phases of matter, but we don't know whether it's like the moon or whether it's like Mercury, right? That's, 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 uh, which, that, that's, uh, which by the way has a, I can't resist, I'm sorry, it's a tangent. But uh, you know, in philosophy of physics, there's this idea that falsification is very important for theories that should be falsifiable. But the point is, when you have something that doesn't work, you never know in advance whether you falsified the theory or whether you haven't been careful enough. Right? So, does the orbit of the moon falsify Newtonian mechanics? No. But for 100 years, nobody knew that. Right? So, you know, you have to be careful with this falsification stuff. Anyway, okay. So, uh, what this at least motivates is asking a more general picture. Which is, can we get just a class, can we classify all possible phases of matter at zero temperature? Okay, so this at least motivates uh, the following the following endeavor. Um, can we just classify all possible finite density phases of matter? By finite density, I mean finite charge density. Well, that seems difficult, although actually there has been 
a lot of progress in this for GAP systems and this whole story about topological insulators that some of you might have heard of. There sort of is a classification. However, in these lectures, I'm more interested in gapless systems that have low energy excitations, like a Fermi circuits or, or Goldstone bosons. Okay, for those systems, this looks very tricky. Okay, uh, so a slightly weaker statement is: Can we at least find concrete examples uh, that fall outside one to three? That's, that's a weaker objective, but at least you know, broaden our minds, right? We want to find examples. How could it not be one of these three things? Okay. Um, right. And so, this is of course where we're going to make a holographic turn. And the, the, the point, right, is that these pictures are very much tied to a weakly coupled intuition. Okay. So, the idea both of, so in, in the superfluid, it's basically these single particle states that build up the condensates. In a Fermi surface, it's manifestly a single particle picture, right? That you're occupying all these states. And of course, in this crystal, these are, you know, you can actually see the particles, okay? Uh, so, uh, the phases one to three that I've talked about are completely based on single particle intuition. That's not quite true, but, uh, which is the same as saying with coupling. Now that's not quite true because the Goldstone theorem is a general thing, and also the Schlesinger theorem is a general thing. However, the Schlesinger theorem explicitly depends on the propagator of, of an electron, which is a you know, particle. Okay, and so we'd like to have characterization of phases that don't depend on things such as single particle Green's functions because you don't know what the particles are. So. Okay, so, uh, excellent. Where am I next? Here. So we'd like to find some examples that don't fall outside one to three. Actually, in one plus one dimensions, there, this is quite well, and there, there are lots, all sorts of things can happen. So let's stay away from that. So in dimensions bigger than one plus one, it's uh, hard, okay? So the only tool we really have is perturbation theory. Um, and so what holography, one way of thinking about what holography is, is that it gives you a set of controlled examples of strong interacting theories in greater than one plus one dimension. I mean, it also works in one plus one, of course. But in one plus one, there are many other tools that we can use. Okay. So, as an example, let's see what happens if we, you know, we're going to consider Lagrangians as schematically in the form. So this is our a holographic Lagrangian. All right. So we imagine there's some SUN gauge field, which I'll come to in a second. There's some, there's some matter, some bosons, there's some fermions, there's some interactions between the bosons, there's some interactions with the fermions. And there's some more stuff. There could be many species of bosons, many species of fermions, complicated gauge groups, and so on and so forth. But schematically, that's the that's what you want to have in mind when you're thinking about holographic theory. And so, for example, of course, this includes n equals 4, uh, maybe JM, again, schematically. Uh, and also, it includes this whole landscape of ADS vacua, where you might not know the dual theory exactly, but it certainly exists. Landscape of ADS vacua of, of string theory. Okay, so there are many, many, many uh, 
theories that have holographic duals. Okay. Now, this will connect a little bit with our previous discussion. So this is, of course, so it's an important thing in, in these condensed matter approaches. But the reason I'm very happy to put a squiggle here and, and do this, is that this is the microscopic Lagrangian in the field theory. Okay? And it has bosons and fermions and gauge fields in it. But what I'm, what I'm going to care about is the ground state of the system at finite density, okay? which is not going to have, I'm saying, this Lagrangian is a sort of weakly interacting picture of the theory. What we're more interested in is a strongly interacting picture of the theory, which is the gravity dual. Okay? But nonetheless, it's true that these theories of gravity duals, they tend to have both bosons and fermions. So that's a nice thing. Those are the ingredients that we want to have. And then they also have uh, a gauge field. Okay. So I've already talked about bosons and fermions, but I haven't talked about gauge fields, so I now want to say a few words about gauge fields in kinetic okay. So, so, okay, so again, in the, the rest of these lectures, okay, we're going to be talking about theories that are schematically of this form and that have gravity duals. If you like, you can have in your mind that equals four super angles. But it's important to bear in mind that there's a much larger class of theories to which what I'm talking about applies. Good. And this connection to our previous discussion, in the sense that they have bosons and fermions, these, these will be charged under some U1 symmetry. And now I just want to say a few words about the gauge field. So, uh, in, in condensed matter physics, there are uh, various ways uh, to get emergent gauge fields. So I just want to very quickly outline one of them. It's possibly relevant to some of these exotic materials I talked about. Um, and so, what they're typically related to are constraints. I'm sorry, I have a question. Yes. It might be a very simple question, but shouldn't there be another derivative in the assumption of curve? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, this is the box, which uh -huh. is the graph square. Oh, okay. Okay. I think now that I'm in box, I'm not, uh, <laughs> not totally. Anyway. Um, I don't know why I wrote it like that, to be honest. Okay, good. So, uh, any other questions? Um, so that typically, when you get a working case series, when you have certain constraints. On, on the Hubbard space. Okay, so let's, uh, an example, let's just outline an example of this. So an example, let's say, I'm going to go to a lattice description for a moment. It's not essential, but it's just a bit useful. So let's say you have a lattice. These are the sites on a lattice. And you have some fermions, some electrons that can hop from side to side on your lattice. Okay. But let's say that now electrons can be spin up or spin down. So in principle, on each side, they could be zero, they could be spin up, they could be spin down, they could be both. Right? That's, that's allowed. Uh, however, say if there's a strong on-site repulsion, okay, because the electrons, of course, have a Coulomb interaction between them, and so if I have one electron there, it will cost me energy to put another electron on the same site. Right? Let's take a limit with that extra energy is infinite. Okay, so you just, it really doesn't want to have two electrons on one site. Okay, so that limit, you have what's called the no-double occupancy uh, constraint. Okay, so this this means right that let's write that term, that's 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 C I C I dagger S where S can be up or down to spin and I is the site right so this is the I site that's the spin this is the creation operator for an electron at this site so another block you can see is this is the statement that at each site so uh, for all I C I up 
dagger, so that's the number of up electrons plus the number of down electrons, <laughs> less or equal to one. Okay, there can be no electron, there can be a spin up or spin down, but they can't be both. Okay. So that's a constraint on the on the physical Hilbert space in, in this limit. Okay. So I'm doing this because I'm going to argue in a second that this can lead to emerging gauge fields. rather annoying constraint because it's an inequality, not an equality. Okay, and it's uh, not, not totally easy to impose that. And so, what the emerging gauge field? One way you can think about it is it's going to turn this inequality into <coughs> equality. And in fact, the equality is just going to be conservation of charge of the gauge charge. Let's see. All right. So, so what's the trick? So now let's say. We want to describe the low-energy excitation of the spin chain. Um, right, so let's imagine the following. So, uh, is there a way of doing inequality of uh, the limit of integral of delta function, which is that function? Say it again. So when you have an equality, you can put a magnetic supplier. Yes, that's what we're going to. That's what we're heading towards. Right, but if you have, that's for delta function. But if you have a step function, typically the derivative of step function is delta function. So can you yeah, maybe. I, I, I actually, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I actually haven't. I'm not saying this is. Yeah, I actually. What? Um, well, probably it's not possible because the fields you integrate over are not real or anything, and it's too sketchy to just think about. Like, yeah, I haven't thought it. It's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. So now let's imagine two a scenario. For example, let's say you have a whole bunch. This is a certain state. Consider. A bunch of off spins on each side and it's been down. Okay, so actually what I'm simply gonna start imagining that's in our head, I don't think it's totally essential, but it's imagine that we're close to half filling. Okay, that means that there's on average, if you have a uh, lattice with hundred sites, that there are almost hundred electrons in the system. Okay, so they're gonna be roughly one per site. So you can have this. But then clearly, what can happen is these spins can swap. So that can go to a state where that spin goes there. And then that spin can move again and go here. Okay. And so you see what's happening here is that no charge is moving. There's always one charge on each side, but the down spin is moving, it can move around, right? And the charge cannot move because of this constraint, right? And so basically what's happened is the spin has acquired a life of its own, independent of the charge. Now another thing that can happen. Now let's imagine a picture where you have, well, an electron on each side, and here there's, but here there's no electron. Okay, then what can happen is this electron well, can move there, then it can move there. Okay, so this is a hole. So a hole has a charge relative to the average, it has charge minus one if you like but it doesn't have a spin. This is not a, the absence of an upspin or the absence of a downspin, it's just the absence of a charge here, okay? So, low energy excitations are things called spin-ons. Mm -hmm. Sorry, there are these guys and holons, which are these guys. And so, in general, this is called spin-charge separation. Okay, and so it's telling us that even though the microscopic degrees of freedom are electrons, the emergent low-energy degrees of freedom, due to this constraint, are, we could make it, we could guess, it looks like they want to be particles that carry spin but no charge, and particles that carry charge but no spin. Okay, it looks at least plausible. So now let's say you want to put some mathematics behind this intuition. What you might be tempted to do is redefine the variables. Let's say imagine you have some path integral or something. motivate 
targets. Redefining a variables, for example, so C, C on the side I, with some spin S, we want to write it as a product of some field F, that's side I, with spin S, and some boson, that's side I. It's conventional to put a dagger there, but not essential. So, and the idea is this guy is going to be, uh, well, that's going to be the spin on, and that one's going to be the boson, uh, sorry, the whole one. So, that, so what you're going to hope is that you're going to, okay, well, so very good. Suppose you kept the original variables and you tried to get the low-energy description. What is clear is that because the low-energy description wants to involve these excitations, it's going to be extremely strongly coupled in terms of the original variables. So what you're trying to do is guess some new variables so that the low-energy description is weakly interacting. So there's some these spin-ons look like they might just be able to just move. And the holons look like they can just move through the material whilst the actual original electrons can't move. So clearly their propagator is completely different from the microscopic propagator that you have in the UV, which is just some hopping. Okay. So by doing this, what you're trying to do is guess the low energy excitations. Um, okay. You know, what this ends up being, we'll see in a moment, is the inverse of confinement. Okay. So in high energy physics, you're used to say, well, I put some quarks into the, the UV Lagrangian, but the emergent low energy degrees of freedom are things like mesons and baryons, which are bound states of these guys. Okay? Here is the opposite. The physical guys are the electrons, and what emerges at low energies are, are these, these spin and the, char and the charge that can move by itself. Okay? So like, it's a deconfinement, the microscopic, exactly. So again, in high energy physics, the quarks are fundamental and the mesons are not. All right? This is like saying, if this happens, uh, the mesons are the microscopic degrees of freedom, and the quarks emerge at low energies. Okay, it's like a little. Um, okay, so where was I? All right. And now a nice thing in terms of these degrees of freedom is that this constraint becomes. Firstly, this constraint becomes linearized because what can you have at each site? You can have an electron or no electron. So the constraint now becomes that at each site you either have a spin up. Spin down. Oops. Or you have nothing, which is a hole. So that now equals one. Okay. So that's nice because it's an equality, not an inequality. And furthermore, so all we're doing here is rewriting the way we're prioritizing Hilbert space. But when you do this, it turns out there's a redundancy because if you let f go to e to the i theta f, and b, e to the i theta b, this leaves, leaves c invariant. And so there's a, and you can do this independently at each site. Okay, so it's really a gauge redundancy. And in fact, this ties together beautifully with this constraint. Because you now have to, when you, you add, so to implement this constraint, you can do what Pedro wanted us to do. We can introduce a Lagrange multiplier that enforces this constraint. That you do in the, in the UV. Okay? You, you, you do this change of variables in the path integral, you introduce a, this constraint. And then, when you start doing the RG flow, this Lagrange multiplier will actually become dynamical. You'll generate a kinetic term for Lagrange multiplier, and it'll become a gauge field will become a photon. Right? So the gauge redundancy is, the is this constraint, which is basically Gauss's law. This is saying that at each site, the charge has to be one. Okay? These, these are all, this means, this thing means that both F and B are charged under this emergent gauge field. Okay? And so this is now the total gauge charge at each site, and it's forced to be one. Explaining this in detail, my, my objective here, I'm happy to give people references. My, I'm just trying to motivate the emergence that, that gauge fields are not a ridiculous thing in, in condensed wire systems. Okay, so let's just write that down. Uh, the Lagrange 
multiplier. Forcing the constraints. Under RG flow, uh, you generate a kinetic term. And so it becomes an emergent U1 gauge field. Now, there's an important lesson here that, of course, you, nothing stops you doing a change of variables in the path integral whenever you want, okay? It's just, a, it's just an integral. So now suppose you take a system that doesn't have this double occupancy constraint, and you say, well, you know what? I feel like doing this change of variables uh, today. So I just do my change of variables. I'll have to introduce a Lagrange multiplier. I'll get this emergent gauge field. So it seems like you could always have an emergent gauge field. But that's not true, because what will happen is generically the gauge field will just confine right away, and it will bind. These, these guys will get bound back in turn to the original electrons. So in a conventional system, where the electrons, the, the microscopic electrons don't do anything funny, the weakly coupled description is in terms of the microscopic electrons, and these emergent degrees of freedom will be strongly interacting, because the gauge field will confine. If the gauge field doesn't confine, then the spin-ons and the hold-ons are the right degrees of freedom. Okay? So it's a dynamical question. So you can always introduce a, a gauge field just to redundancy. All right? So in a condensed matter system, you can introduce gauge fields whenever you want. But it'll only be useful if the gauge fields don't confine. Okay? Which, is a, which is, you have to solve the system and see what happens. Okay? So, uh, okay, right. so, so the important question is emerging new one gauge field is does it confine or not. So this, this process, which is like the inverse of confinement, okay, that you get this new degrees of freedom, so this is sort of the inverse of confinement. This, some, this is one instance of what people can mean. They sometimes describe this with the word fractionalization. Okay, so fractionalization is that you have a microscopic degree of freedom, but the low energy description is given in terms of some parts of this usually coupled to some emerging gauge field. Okay. Unfortunately, people use this word for other things as well, but that, that's one thing that it means. Now we will get to holography. So, exactly. So the idea is we want to open that more important in our mind about what possible phases of matter can exist, and we'd like to have a strongly coupled description. And we're going to, oh, yeah, we're going to have strongly coupled descriptions that are given by theories of this kind. So this is the picture of how a fractionalization, there are actually, with the exception of sort of topological theories, things like the Kitaev model, which some of you might have, might have heard of, it's generally very difficult to prove whether this actually happens or not in a given model, especially in higher than two dimensions, let's say two plus one. So, uh, you know, people like Ijubal, so it would be great to have more solvable models, especially in higher dimensions of a lattice model where you can prove that the electron fractionalizes at low energies. You know, the same way that we have solvable models for confinement in higher dimensions and supersymmetric theories, it would be nice to have solvable models of fractionalization that are not sort of topological. Or, so the, the, the solvable models involve, involve things like C2 gauge symmetries and so on. Okay, it'd be nice to have a provable emergent new one without large n. There are also solvable models at large n. Okay, so it'd be nice. So I don't know, maybe there's some. That would be nice. All right, good. So 
in the last few minutes. What time did I actually start? 10? Okay, awesome. So how do we set up this problem that we set ourselves of classifying phases of matter? What's the holographic version of this? So, so holographic version of our question. Hinge again. What's the low energy? What does the low energy description look like when you have a finite density? So remember the holography. This is you know, our favorite picture. And so we have some d plus one gauge theory living at the boundary. We have some d plus two gravity in the bulk. Okay. And the essential dictionary, the essential dictionary uh, between them, is that every for every single trace operator O in the gauge theory that corresponds a field phi in the bulk. Okay. Uh, is anybody not familiar with this statement? So was that a hand? It's okay. Uh, so okay, so um, so an example of this, so some examples would be one operator here might be the engine momentum tensor. That's dual to the metric in the bulk. Another example might be something like trace F squared. That's a certain operator in the boundary. That would be dual to, like, roughly, dual to something like a dilaton in the bulk, and so on. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. So these are the fields. If you write your supergravity action in the bulk, it's made out of certain fields. And the interpretation for every one of these fields, there'll be a corresponding single trace means that it's all inside the trace. Single trace operator in the boundary. Okay. And once we have this connection, yes. Um, so the modifications will be made by kind of taking a field in the bulk and uh, uh, going to the bound to the field, the value of this field in the boundary. Right? Is there a way to find the operator that is dual to the field? Uh, Excellent. So I'm going to write down what you just said in a second, which is the. I'm about to explain how these are related, but your question is exactly. So if I've got some field theory, how do I know what the dual. Uh, right, and so in general, that's very tricky. And because. Very good. And I. Yeah. So sometimes symmetries will constrain it. Okay, right. Uh, in general. Right, so actually, I think that. Found answer to this question is it's probably not the right question in general because you see when you write down and some people like having dimensions of things might might disagree but from the perspective of what I'm doing it's not the right question because this Lagrangian that I wrote for the field theory is the weakly coupled description of the field theory okay but when I'm at strong coupling I don't really care whether it's trace I don't know phi squared psi squared or trace phi to the fourth. So if they have the same quantum numbers and the same everything, the whole point is to get away from the microscopic description. So it, it's it, it's not too essential. But what is essential are things like symmetry, keeping track of symmetries. So for example, the adjoint tensor and the metric, you know, both some sort of spin to thing. Okay. So beyond symmetries, uh, I'm not even sure it's well defined at the end of the day. But there should be some counting that had better work out, right? Okay, that's true. There should be sort of the same number of things you can build here and the same number of things you can build there. So again, a lot of the early tests of this correspondence came because symmetries, especially when you have supersymmetry, you can identify things on both sides, then you can calculate things and check that they match. Okay, so that, that's, that was a useful at the beginning. But I think, in terms of thinking about physics, it, it's not so essential. It might even be misleading. All right. Any other questions?
mean, roughly, yeah, I guess rough, very roughly, it, it's something like there's sort of going to be flux tubes between, if you separate a spin and a hole, you sort of create a flux tube of, in a case where it's confining, where they want to be together, then the gauge field is, yeah, it's some kind of flux tube between them. But it's a little, it's a little formal. Actually, I don't have a, 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 yeah, I don't know very particularly, I don't know how to draw the gauge field in the way I drew these guys. So, okay, so we have this, and there's this identification of operators and fields, and that allows us, I'm sure you all know, the single essential equation of holography, uh, which is that the partition function in the bulk, where all these fields tend to some boundary value of phi zero, sometimes there's some sort of power, some fall off in the radial direction. So let me say right now that I'm going to use a coordinate r with apologies that is zero at the boundary and increases as you go in. Okay. So most fields, as they go towards the boundary, they'll go with some power of r and then the constant is the boundary value, phi zero. So the essential dictionary is that this quantity, so again, the partition function as a function of the boundary data is equal to the expectation value in your quantum field theory, uh, where you insert an operator with a coupling given by the boundary value. So this object contains all the information you could want to know. It's the generating function uh, of all possible correlators in this theory for all possible operators. Right? So in principle, you can calculate anything you want by taking derivatives of this guy with respect to the sources. And it is, this dictionary tells you how to calculate that in the bulk by putting in certain boundary conditions here. Okay. So let's do an example that's relevant to us. Uh, so how do we add? We want to add a chemical potential. Okay. So we know that a chemical potential is that you take the Lagrangian and you add a mu JT term. Okay. So adding this term amounts to inserting mu T. So that's the term that we're adding. So we want to, we want to put that here. Right? So the first thing we have to do is identify the field in the bulk that's dual to uh, JT. And so it's a general fact that uh, conserved currents in the boundary are dual to Maxwell fields in the bulk. Um, and so that means that what we need to do, uh, so we need to add a Maxwell field to the bulk such that with the boundary condition that AT, the, the, the electrostatic potential in the bulk, goes to a some boundary value, which is mu. Right? Because this operator, we're doing a case where this operator is jt, and this boundary value is then mu at this term. And so what we need is our metal field at goes to mu at the boundary. Right? That, that's the way this dictionary works for the case of the charge. Uh, I think I need three more on this. So. Okay. Um, okay, so let's see what that what that means. Um, so by definition, the charge, the expectation value of the charge is uh, yeah, it's the derivative. If I differentiate this thing with respect to mu, I'll bring down the factor of the charge, right? And this thing is equal to that. So the charge is a derivative of this partition function with at going to mu uh, with respect to mu. Right? That, that's, that's just what the, what the charge is. 
Okay, so now there's some standard calculations that I'm going to skip. Um, I mean, it's not it's like half a page. Okay? It's not something crazy, uh, but I don't want to do it here. Just but you can look it up in this review I wrote a few years ago. Uh, section. So it turns out what you get is the following. So before I fill this in, uh, let's write down something. So near the boundary, if you solve the Maxwell equations in the bulk, AT is going to go like AT0, the boundary value, plus some subleading terms. So R times AT1 plus a bunch of subleading terms. This is as R goes to zero near the boundary. So it turns out that what you get when you take the partition function, which in the semi-classical limit is e to the action, okay, and you differentiate with respect to the boundary value, what you get, it turns out, is this subleading term, at1, after some coffee time. There might be some numbers here, that doesn't matter. Okay, so, in fact, it's a very general thing. Okay, so fields in the bulk satisfy second order equations of motion. All right, so they're two constants of integration. When you go near the boundary, there'll be a leading term and a subleading term, in general, with some powers of R here. And when you differentiate the on shell partition function with respect to the boundary value, you always get the subleading term. Okay, it's, and what this should might. might you know, remind you of this actually, this is how Hamilton Jacobi theory works in, in classical mechanics. When we take the action, differentiate with respect to the position at the end point, you get the momentum at the end point. Position and momentum are the two degrees of freedom. So let me so just remind you, this is exactly the same as Hamilton Jacobi theory. So there, the momentum is a derivative of the action with respect to the boundary value, Q final, of the position. Remember, a particle, let's say a free particle, has two q, would be qf plus the momentum times the time for a free particle, right? So this, this is relating the two constants of integration of your free particle, okay? It's the same thing. There are two constants of integration, and the derivative of the action with respect to the first one gives you the second one. Oh, one more minute, I'm sorry, one more slide. So the nice thing is that AT1, that's just a derivative of AT as R goes to zero, with respect to R, right? I'll pick out this term. And in a gauge, in a gauge where you set AR to zero, that's just the electric field. gauge where a r equals to zero, which is a very useful gauge, then this term, so what we're doing, dr a t is just f r t, okay, and that's the electric flux, okay. So the last and we're done. So this is the picture that we're end with today. So what we've seen is that if you have an expect if you want to put the system of finite charge density the JT, okay, that's what we're starting with there, that's equal to the flux in the bulk at the boundary E. Um, so then what we're going to start doing next time, what we need to do, the question of what is low energy physics comes with this boundary condition in the bulk, that there's an electric flux, what does the interior of the space-time look like? Right, so what we need to do is work out the interior. Okay, it turns out this describes low energy physics. So with this constraint, that there's some electric flux, let's solve Einstein's equation and see what happens here. Okay, that's how we answer this question in, in a lot.